Welcome to the Tech Ed Podcast, where we visit with leaders who are shaping, innovating, and disrupting technical education. People who are not afraid to think differently, not afraid to try something new, all with the goal of securing the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. I am Matt Kirkner, your host for the Tech Ed Podcast, and I have a long-held belief that times have a way of finding their leaders. I don't think that's an original thought, but it's true. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., Churchill, Patton, throughout history, it is genuinely uncanny how the right person steps forward at exactly the right time with exactly the right gifts and abilities. And as we begin today's Tech Ed podcast, I can't help but think our guest is exactly such a leader. As Wisconsin's Adjutant General, Major General Paul Knapp commands the Wisconsin National Guard. And as we will discuss today, that is no small job. Major General Knapp is a good friend. He is a great leader and exactly the right leader for these times in Wisconsin's history. Major General Paul Knapp, it is great to have you with us. Thanks, Matt. It's uh, great to be here today and very excited. I'm uh, humbled by that introduction. Excited to talk to you today on this podcast. And what a year it's been for the Wisconsin National Guard. You've secured our state during the protests in Milwaukee and Madison and Kenosha, in my original hometown of Wauwatosa. You've provided security efforts during the national presidential inauguration, all the things that happened along with COVID-19. You even, and I love this, you even mobilized to maintain security during the Milwaukee Bucks championship celebration during and after game six. Now, initially, when you accepted your current position, I think it's been now like 17 months, you knew you were signing up for guiding the Wisconsin National Guard through allegations of sexual harassment and perhaps some other challenges, but did you ever think you would have the kind of year that you had? Well, the short answer to that is no. Like everyone uh, listening to this podcast had no idea what was in store for us in terms of the uh, pandemic that we experienced in 2020 and uh, actually through to today. So that was quite a surprise. However, couldn't have you know taken command and uh, leadership of a better team uh, that had been more prepared for this pandemic. And in fact, really any issue that would come up as kind of you went through the laundry list of some of the things that we did uh, over the course of the last year. And it just never s- ceased to surprise me the things that the uh, Department of Military Affairs, Wisconsin National Guard, Wisconsin Emergency Management and Office of Emergency Communications could really accomplish when we really set our minds to it in support of the residents of the state of Wisconsin. And, you know, being the humble leader that you are, you always give credit to others. You always give credit to your team. And I know you're proud of the team that you have at the Wisconsin National Guard. I want to explore another team that you have spent some time on. Uh, You and I had a conversation about six months ago about your uh, role in the administration of Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers. Now, you're not a member of the cabinet per se, but I remember you telling me that you had a seat in the inner workings and all of the behind the scenes discussions around the COVID-19 crisis. I'd be interested if you would tell us about that experience and, and going through that with such an interesting group of leaders. What did you learn about both leadership and execution during that journey? Absolutely. It's been quite an honor and a privilege to be on the team and uh, on the in the inner circle of the governor's policy group in the pandemic response. As you mentioned, uh, my position is not political appointment. It is a governor's appointment. I'm not on the cabinet, but it's a cabinet level position. So uh, I think in the the almanac, it says that we're other government agencies. It would be myself, the Supreme Court, and the Department of Justice for the state kind of fit in that category. But because of my role as the commander of the National Guard and the director of emergency management for the state, when an incident like this occurs, then I was pulled into that inner circle. And uh, it has been an amazing experience to be part of the response of the state during the pandemic. As I was thinking about, or as I think back at that time, you know, I've created bonds and relationships with those other leaders who were in that inner circle that were really forged in crisis. And I've had other relationships forged in crisis during times of uh, participation in combat operations. And I can tell you from experience, these are lifetime bonds with the people around me during the last year. I love the reference to the bonds and relationships that you create 
working through crises as those you have and that you've led the National Guard through over the course of the last year. You know, it's such an interesting path that you've taken to find your way into this current position. I remember Major General reading an article not too long ago, I think shortly after uh, you assumed your current position, in which you, after becoming Brigadier General, you had asked a friend of yours if it was possible to one day become Adjutant General. And that friend uh, was a little bit discouraging. They said that there was really no way that that path was possible. And here we are. You are, in fact, Wisconsin's Adjutant General, the state's top military leader. Share that story, if you would, with your audience. And how did you defy those odds to rise to the position you hold presently? I kind of cherish that story because I hope it's, you know, an inspiration. And I use that to, when I talk to my kids and to other kids that, you know, anything that you put your mind to, you have the potential to accomplish. Uh, And in this case, I was originally in the active duty for 11 years. And then I was an Air Force reservist for 17 years. And it was during that period of time where, where I was promoted to Brigadier General. And I did think, because I have been living in Wisconsin this whole time, and I thought, wow, the adjutant general job would be a great way for me to serve, continue to serve, and do it in and for Wisconsin. And so I asked a buddy of mine who is in the National Guard in another state, what do you have to do to become the tag? How does that work? What are the inner workings? And he basically said the equivalent of, well, bless your heart. (laughs) You know, isn't that cute that you think you could be the tag? Because you've never been in the National Guard. And if you haven't been in the National Guard, that's not something that should even be on your uh, wish list. And so I kind of, you know, said, oh, really, I didn't realize that. And, uh, and then went about with other things. Uh, And then in uh, December of 2019, when I saw my predecessor was going to be leaving the office, and that I knew that the position was open, I actually dug into it and did a little research and found out that in Wisconsin, and all each state is different in Wisconsin, If you're a currently serving flag officer, of which a Brigadier General is one, then in any service that you're eligible to apply for the adjutant general position. And so always being one that I was willing to throw my hat in the ring, I decided to put together a resume and submitted it to Governor Evers' administration and went through the vetting process as well as a number of interviews, which culminated with an interview with the governor. And I was fortunate and blessed to be selected as the adjutant general. So it uh, ended up coming true after all, in in spite of uh, some predictions. Well, that really is just a great story about the importance of, as you put it, being willing to put your hat in the ring. Um, And it is, it truly is an inspiration to others as we look at you know, what could be or what might be, whether it's in our career, whether it's in our academic journey, uh, regardless, uh, you won't get there unless you dream a little bit and you won't get there unless you're willing to put yourself out into traffic and take advantage of that opportunity. You also won't get there without a tremendous amount of commitment. And I know that you have had that throughout your entire career in so many different ways. I want to talk about the commitment on the part of our National Guardsmen and the National Guard requires you know, such an incredible commitment, certainly from your soldiers and airmen, also requires a commitment on the part of employers to make this whole thing work. Those who employ guardsmen accommodate their service. So first of all, why do guardsmen make excellent employees? And also what message would you have to employers who might be considering hiring members of the National Guard? Well, Matt, I couldn't agree more. The commitment of the National Guard and the National Guard members, I, well, I can't say enough about it. One of the ways that we do describe it is that there's uh, there are three competing priorities for someone who serves in a reserve component like the National Guard, and you have uh, that triad of competing priorities. Which uh, number one is your family, number two is your civilian job, uh, and then number three would be your service to the National Guard and the state. And so, keeping all three of those in balance is how we how we support and how we attempt to have wellness amongst the force. Uh, and we stress that, and that's a big topic amongst uh, us here in the National Guard, especially with the Operations Temple over the last year. And employers play a huge role in that wellness of our service members and their balance in their lives. I can't say enough how much I appreciate the support of the employers in the state of Wisconsin over the course of the last year. It has just been off the charts. Over the course of a normal year, you have great support from employers because of that traditional National Guard commitment of 
a weekend a month and two weeks a year, which by the way, is a great, a great bumper sticker or a slogan, but even in a normal year, a National Guard soldier or airman generally does more service than that. That is the absolute minimum. And especially here in Wisconsin, our soldiers and airmen rarely settle for the minimum. They almost always step up for more responsibility. So over the course of the pandemic, not only did we have great support from the soldiers and airmen in stepping up to help their fellow Wisconsinites, but the support from the employers and the understanding uh, of those employers has just been off the charts. And in fact, I would get communications from employers not only saying, thank you for your service and thank you for the service of the Guard members, but is there anything we, else we can do in addition to supporting our Guard members that are right now deployed, giving COVID tests or helping at a, a nursing home or fill in the blank, all the different things that we did to include election support over the last year was, was unprecedented for the National Guard. It's a really, really interesting answer there, Major General, talking about balancing those three priorities, balancing family and a civilian job and service, uh, the employer's role, important role, and as you put it, supporting and understanding uh, the service and the commitment that our National Guardsmen have. But support and understanding can also be important in terms of the transition of an individual serving in the military as they move into whatever comes next into that civilian career. And there's certainly some similarities and there are a lot of skill sets and a lot of experiences that prepare an individual for service in civilian life. But there's also a need to transition because they're not exactly the same. What are some of the challenges that you would outline for a member of our military as they transition from full-time military service to leaving the military and serving in the private sector? That's a great question, in particular because it, it lets me highlight a couple nuances to veteran services and employing veterans. There are a couple different categories and of military service, and one is the reserve component, and one is the active component, or your full-time service member and your, I hate to say it, part-time, but your, your service member that is a reserve component member, a guardsman or a, or a reservist. And the distinction is when you have a full-time military member, they're making a much more difficult transition into a civilian career because they haven't had that civilian career so far in their life, potentially. In fact, myself, I went straight from high school to the Air Force Academy to active duty for 11 years. And when I made that jump at the end of active duty to become a reservist, it was very scary, uh, frankly, to actually leave that full-time employment with the uh, active duty Air Force in this case, and then have to go out there into the civilian world and try and find a career. And uh, from personal experience, it was not nearly as easy as I had thought. And one of the big things is it's very difficult for both service members to translate their skill sets that they gain in the military careers to the civilian sector. And it's also hard for the civilian sector employers to wrap their minds around and translate those skill sets that a service member might put on their resume and how they could apply those in their workplace. And so that's one of the things that we try and offer in terms of employment services is we do a lot of resume assistance and helping those service members translate that military skill, which if you don't translate it, it really doesn't come across well and may not translate well. But if you have somebody who does that uh, as a matter of course, and they're trained in doing that translation and being that kind of middleman that connects the dots between what the service member did and what the service member can do and their potential on the civilian side, that's hugely important. And then on the second part of that is our, as I mentioned, we have that triad of our guard airmen and soldiers where they are actually, many of them actually have a civilian job and they have a military career. So for those folks, they already have a civilian career. And so our big concern there is that relationship with the employers and making sure that there's understanding between open communication between the employer and the employee, the guard member employee. And then also for me, in terms of wellness of the force of here with the Wisconsin National Guard, uh, what I really want to try and, and get to is those soldiers and airmen who are either unemployed on the civilian side, kind of taking their balance out of whack, or what I'll say is uh, underemployed in a job that where they aren't maximizing the use of their skill sets, which we do find a fair amount where you've got a soldier or an airman who has a real, has a great 
either leadership, technical background, specific skill sets, but hasn't been able to, to leverage those on the civilian side. And so I'm really excited of when we can help a soldier or airman go from a status of being unemployed or underemployed and help them to become employed in something that's really a rewarding job. And it needs to be at least as rewarding as their uh, military service. And that sometimes that's a challenge. Now, let's explore that in a little bit more detail. I understand that we might be breaking a little bit of news here on the Tech Ed podcast today, but the Wisconsin National Guard, as I've been told, will soon announce a partnership with Operation Next and Western Technical College in La Crosse, Wisconsin, through which members of the Guard who are transitioning from military service or maybe underemployed, looking for that next opportunity, will be provided with industry-relevant skills and related training for rewarded careers in manufacturing and in industry. So can you tell our audience about this new initiative and how it solves some of the challenges that we just discussed? Well, hey, Matt, you actually were the one who connected the dots on this one for us, and that's Operation Next, uh, which I'm hugely excited about. And I think you're right. I think this is the announcement of our partnership with Western Technical College in this program. And this is exactly what I was getting at uh, in the previous question when I said that we really need to work together to try and get these Guard members meaningful employment inside of the civilian sector here in Wisconsin. What the partnership with the Western Technical College, what that does through a program called Operation Next, it's going to allow us to offer right now, we're starting off with two different programs. One is going to be a CNC operator program, and the other one is going to be a robotics technician program. And I believe we have around 20 slots set aside for the fall of 2021. And that's going to be available at no charge to Wisconsin National Guard service members, their spouses, and their dependents. So this is a really broad, broad uh, offering here as we get ramped up. We want to make sure and fill all those slots. But it's going to be a combination of virtual and in-person training And at the end of the day, in particular, the CNC operator program starting this fall, they'll get National Institute of uh, Metalworking Skills certifications, uh, which is very critical, uh, as you know, in the uh, in the STEM career fields is having that certification, that baseline qualification that for my soldiers and airmen, that'll get their foot in the door uh, and allow them to showcase those other leadership core value attributes that they have when they interview for a job here in Wisconsin. Well, and credit to you, Major General, for your leadership and certainly uh, the leadership of the folks at Operation Next, as well as Western Technical College for coming up with a really, really creative program uh, that I think addresses a lot of different needs in terms of individuals transitioning to civilian life. You referenced them, third-party certification, so very important, having a credential when you walk in the door of that employer, being able to establish that you have certain skills and competencies And this is one of those situations where literally everyone is a winner. Certainly the guard is a winner. The soldier, the airman who's participating in the program ends up getting a head start on a new career and the employer as well, right? So now they've got an individual coming to their front door who's got great experience in the military, great experience now with this training that they have and really launches them on a trajectory toward a a really rewarding career. So fantastic And thank you so much for choosing the Tech Ed Podcast to be the platform on which you announced that tremendous initiative. So you should be very proud of that. I want to now kind of rewind a little bit in the life, if you will, of someone serving in our military, obviously transitioning from the military to civilian life, civilian employment, an important transition. But it all starts with a young person or a person of some age making a decision to enter military service in the first place. On the Tech Ed podcast, we talk with educators, we talk with employers on this whole topic of career pathways. Uh, We're big advocates for schools and parents and communities, providing awareness to students for all of the options to them as they transition from high school. And that might be a two-year degree at a community or a technical college. Maybe it's a four-year degree at a university or other college. Apprenticeships are a great route, as is direct-to-work force for a student going directly from high school, going into the workforce. Now, another great path for graduating high school seniors is military service. What message, Major General, do you have for high schoolers who are considering service in our nation's military? Well, first of all, uh, I just want to say that it's a great option can say that from experience. I have absolutely no regrets 
about my military service throughout uh, my entire adult life. And one of the, the big things that I talk about when I talk to students and high schoolers and other folks that might be interested in military service or interested in exploring all their options is are, are the number of options that are out there for military service specifically, and then other service more generally. And so specifically with the military, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's that you can serve in an active duty capacity, you can serve in a reserve capacity, which basically that means a reservist, when you talk about, a, say, an army or air reservist versus an army or air national guardsman, you, uh, the difference there is one is federal and one is state. And so a reservist is a federal position and they're always federal. And then uh, National Guard, that's your hometown citizen, soldiers and airmen generally serving in the areas where they grew up and or where they live. They're not always on either state or federal order. They can do both. Our primary mission for the National Guard is to be the primary combat reserve for the active duty Air Force and Army. And then our number two mission is to support the state of Wisconsin under the governor. But getting back to talking about how to talk to kids about this and how to encourage folks to uh, look at the military is basically one of those options, right? I actually have a rising junior in high school. Connor is going to be a junior this year. And one of the things that I continually tell him is that now is the time to look at all the options. Now is the time to figure out what that next step will be. The big thing for kids in particular or high school students is it's hard for them to envision 30 years from now, right? What I tell them to do is pick your next step. Don't pick the final step because you pick that when you get there, but pick the next step and whatever that next step might be. And all of the things that you mentioned are hugely valid. And as it relates to STEM in particular, I'm a huge fan of doing something uh, related to STEM or at a minimum having a great STEM background because everything we do today comes back to that. There isn't probably anyone listening to this that doesn't have some sort of uh, at least one and probably two cell phones in their pocket. They'll probably have a computer on their desk. They may be listening to satellite radio on the dash of their car. All of those things couldn't be possible without someone understanding and knowing building things, producing things, manufacturing things that all come back to STEM. So it's just great advice, for, certainly for your son, Connor. And I also really appreciated the reference to STEM. And I would certainly agree as we look at science, technology, engineering, and math. And frankly, I did the same thing with my own kids, which is really strongly consider those STEM pathways. And no matter how you find your way into a career like that, you have such marketable skills and skills that are going to have staying power in the workforce. It's really, really important. And I know the U.S. military has certainly recognized that importance as well. In recent years, it has highlighted different skills-based STEM roles and its recruitment efforts, and those might align to a student's interests. Uh, fields like cybersecurity, and I should note for our audience that you are Wisconsin's senior state official for cyber matters, but cybersecurity, engineering, coding and programming, healthcare, and so much more. So Major General, for those students in our audience who are interested in STEM fields, how can the military provide opportunities in this area and help prepare them for related careers? The military has been on the cutting edge of things like cybersecurity, STEM technology, let's say, for as long as computers have been in existence. Some of the earliest computers were developed by the military and by the government. What I do have to say is that in today, that balance has shifted. A lot of the, the cutting edge technology is right now shared between government, the Department of Defense, and the civilian sector. And there is quite often a very tight connection between government and the private sector. So we've got private and public partnerships are huge across the, the military and across the National Guard. And we do have a cybersecurity uh footprint here in the state of Wisconsin that is staffed by the Wisconsin National Guard. We have cybersecurity and anything that you would do, whether it was a more traditional military career field like uh, artillery or infantry, those career fields have a foundation in technology. Almost everything we do today has to do with technology. And you mentioned cybersecurity and 
we talk about cybersecurity as a separate environment or or the, the cyber environment being a vulnerability across the business spectrum in the United States. As many of you know, cybersecurity is uh, an area where we're under attack as a country every single day, every single minute. Right now, as we speak, there are other countries that aren't thinking about the best interests of the United States that are trying to steal our secrets and break into our businesses and into the military systems. So that is uh, on the cutting edge of the defense of our nation is cybersecurity, because you can literally launch an attack on the United States from a basement anywhere in the world if you have the right tools and equipment. Just an interesting answer and really highlights the value and the importance of technology in our nation's military. And we think about things like cybersecurity and all the risks that we're under and the important role that our military plays in in helping to make sure that our cyber infrastructure remains as safe and secure as possible. So just an interesting discussion around all of these opportunities for young people as they consider next steps after high school and how a career in our military can prepare them for whatever comes next, uh, whether that is continuing on that path, whether that is moving into the private sector. On this topic of our high school students, on this topic of students considering what comes next, you've got such a, a wealth of experience, Major General, both in the private sector and in the military, uh, all this experience in, in leadership. And I know that our listeners would really value your answer to this question. If you were sitting down with a student, say a, a sophomore in high school, and looking back on everything that you know, everything that you learned, and you could give that high school sophomore just one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? From me personally, I think something that I would stress to that sophomore would be, I would encourage them to do something, whether it's in the military or some other fashion in service to their country. The military isn't the only way to serve your country. There are a number of different ways, whether that is becoming a teacher or a firefighter or going into law enforcement or doing something that contributes to the greater good of our nation. I think we, you know, we've We've gone through a very difficult few years in our country, and I can't stress enough how important it is for the success of our nation to have great young men and women serving both the country, each other, and then themselves as we move forward. Doing something in service to your country, the advice that Major General Paul Knapp would have for our high school sophomores here in the state of Wisconsin across the United States contribute to the greater good. Major General, that's certainly something that you have done throughout your career, most important, at least to uh, to the state of Wisconsin in the last year, leading the National Guard here in the state. I want to thank you first for your humble leadership. You have just a great way about you, uh, your service, both to our state and to your country, not just this last year, but throughout your career. And certainly thank you for being our guest today on the Tech Guide Podcast. Thank you, Matt. It uh, truly is an honor to to be here. It's an honor to serve my state and nation. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe, leave a review, and if you like this episode, share it with a friend. New episodes launch every Tuesday, so listen in next week.